Let's turn to the text. As we said, the work dates to the 8th century, Common Era, in India. It was written in Sanskrit, and there are several versions of it, but for our purposes, we're going to work with the version that our translators have given to us. Now, before we dive into the perfections in more detail, let's take a look at the big picture. The text is split up into chapters, into major sections, and you've only been assigned a few of them. But still, let's look at what the text as a whole is doing, even if you're not reading the entire thing. We can divide the text into two sections. The first is where Shantideva is forming his intention to awaken and to take the bodhisattva vow. And the second part of the text is after he's actually taken those vows, which happens in chapter 3. Once he takes these vows, he's committed to staying in samsara until all beings are freed from suffering. Yeah, he takes the bodhisattva vow. This is actually something he does in the third chapter. So the bodhisattva vow, he commits to remaining in samsara for all time. And I think some of the most evocative parts of the text are these beautiful verses where um, where he gives rise to that aspiration. Um, and then I think there's different ways to understand the text. I think f- sometimes people see this as a sacrifice on the Bodhisattva's part or in Shantideva's part because he remains in samsara. And I actually reject this understanding of it. I think quite distinctive to his text as he develops the perfections and the other qualities of the Bodhisattva he develops them in such a way that they protect the bodhisattva from suffering even within the cycle of samsara. And I think, I mean, this isn't completely obvious, but I think he presents them in such a way that his conception of the deepest flourishing is the bodhisattva remaining in samsara. So one question, as you read the text, is to consider Shanti Deva's attitude to the world of samsara, that is, the world of pain, suffering, life, death, and rebirth. Is his staying in samsara a terrible, difficult sacrifice, or is it the only way that human beings can flourish, is to live in samsara and take on the bodhisattva path? Okay, now one thing we do know, even if we don't know the answer to that question just yet, is that from the very beginning of the text, Shantideva is concerned with making the most out of the moment that he has. He's born in a time, not that long after the life of the historical Buddha, when he knows about the teaching of the Buddha, and he's in a position to take it up. So while lightning might be common, as they say, it rarely strikes twice. So Shanti Deva's point is that the brightness that we have for this flash of time, when basically lightning has struck, is that we should make the most out of it. As he says, this opportune moment is extremely hard to meet. Once met, it yields the welfare of mankind. If the advantage, that is the advantage of this moment, is neglected now, how will the meeting come again? His text then is aimed at instructing others who might want to take the same vow that he does and to take advantage of this unusual opportunity. And this, then, is the point of his teaching the perfections. The the whole idea, and we see this play out in the Bodhicharya Avatara especially, um, are they're this kind of process of, of good mental qualities that you're supposed to cultivate. You're supposed to perfect. That's why they're called perfections. Um, you know, so, so some of these, these perfections, um, you know, include patience or generosity or discipline and the idea behind them and, and why I like that they're called perfections is, you know, there are these things that you continue to develop and refine and improve on and, and get better at throughout your, throughout your life. But Shanti Deva doesn't start with just telling us how to be generous or how to be compassionate. Instead, he starts in chapter 5 in focusing on our mind. He says that it's impossible to guard one's training, that is, the training to be generous or to be compassionate, without guarding the wandering mind. He compares the mind to an elephant, which is out of control. While we might think of elephants as docile creatures living in zoos, in fact, they can cause a lot of damage. They're powerful, and when they're in heat, that is when they're rutting, uh, and they're on a rampage, they can do a lot of harm. But Shantideva says that the mind is worse. What does he mean by that? 
Well, for one thing, he says that the mind is the source of the evils that exist in the world. And our mind isn't under our control. We might wonder if he's right about that. I mean, can't we control our mind? So here's a challenge. I want you to take one minute. We're all going to sit for one minute quietly with our eyes closed. And just notice, are our thoughts and feelings and images that come to mind, are they ones that we've chosen to come into existence? Or did they just happen? Did they just occur? So in other words, I want you to try and pay attention. Is your mind under your active control? Well, if you're anything like me, you noticed that your mind wandered, that some images, some ideas, some thoughts, some feelings came up during just that single moment. So that suggests that our minds are not usually under our control. And this is why before Shanti Deva talks about patience, he begins by drawing attention to our mind. Um, this is where meditation comes in. You know, if you're able to practice understanding what's happening in your mind. You can, you can see things and, and understand what's happening in the world. You can see the world more clearly. You can see your own mind more clearly. So by the time we reach the sixth chapter, where we begin to work on the perfections, Shanti Deva and you, that is the reader or the listener, you've done a lot of work on your mind. If you're following along with Shanti Deva's instructions, and by the time you've gotten to the sixth chapter and you've worked on your mind in all of the ways that he's advising. Um, you're not really like an ordinary person anymore. Um, you you are a, a bodhisattva. You are an awakened being. You're following this, this dedicated path to Buddhahood. With all of this in mind, we can think about what's going on in the chapter on patience or forbearance, which is chapter six. This chapter focuses on humiliation, on harsh speech and disgrace, and ways that other people might physically or emotionally harm us. Now, on one reading, Shantideva seems to be arguing a version of sticks and stones may break my bones, but names will never hurt me. But just like this Calvin and Hobbes cartoon suggests, that idea doesn't seem quite right. It does seem like names can hurt us. So what does he mean? Well, in verses 52 to 53, Shantideva observes that only the body is harmed and not the mind. And so he asks why the mind gets angry if this is the case. We might wonder what's going on here. Is he saying that we shouldn't feel hurt when people injure us physically? Or that when someone is unkind or violent towards us, that we shouldn't have any emotional or mental response at all? You know, if you, if you think about who the person is who would be working on patients at this point, um, who's on the bodhisattva path, they're, they're kind of like... Just a, I, I hesitate to say this, but like a, a better person than, than the rest of us, you know. So, I mean, if you think about um, children, uh, you know, if, if if there's a two year old and they're having a temper tantrum, you you're not going to get anything out of arguing with a two year old or, or trying to reason with a two year old. You know, sometimes you just have to let them have their tantrum. Um, and that's actually the best thing to do in that situation. Um, you know, and so, so Shanti Deva, I think is in one sense, we can see him approaching the idea of patience from that perspective. Like you've worked with your mind. There are all these hateful people in the world who are trying to do things. And you at this point have, have come to recognize that they're actually harming themselves much as or or more than they're harming you by berating you or 
being jerks to you. This suggests that to understand what he's saying here, we have to pay attention to his account of interdependence. In verse 31, Shanti Deva explains that everything is dependent on something else. Nothing exists that wasn't caused by another thing. And nothing that happens is inert. In, in other words, everything that exists itself causes other things, has consequences. The point of this observation seems to be that if everything has a prior cause, then any action that happens, which we get angry at, such as someone hitting us, that also has a prior cause. But does this mean that we shouldn't be angry at the person who hits us with a stick, but instead we should be angry at the stick? Or backing up a little at the tree that the wood was made of? Where does this causal analysis end? Our, our reaction is to get angry at the person who hit you. But if you analyze that situation, it's not the person who hit you. It's actually the stick that inflicted pain. But it's ridiculous to get angry with a stick because a stick has no agency of its own. And so Shanti Deva says, you know, by in in the same way, we also shouldn't get angry at the person because the person doesn't really have agency of his or her own either, because that person is under the influence of or being controlled by their anger. The way Professor Kasser has reconstructed Shanti Deva's argument, the discussion of the stick in verse 41 is implicitly a kind of argument known as a reductio ad absurdum. So that means that we assume I should be angry at the principal cause of my pain. But if that assumption is true, then that means I should be angry at the stick. And that's absurd. So a question to consider then is if this analysis is right, how should we understand Shanti Deva's claim that we should hate hatred if it's hatred that's impelling a person? Okay, finally, let's suppose that we are convinced by Shanti Deva that we should have forbearance when people insult and humiliate us. Does that mean then we should not be angry at things like systemic injustice? What should we think about the stick-wielding police officer and the systems of oppression that we think cause pain and suffering around the world? We'll return to this question at the end of the lecture, but now let's move on and think about chapter 8.